in the Middle East, where Russia is calling on Israel to stop its airstrikes on Iranian targets. The context is a week that has seen a pretty dramatic escalation between Jerusalem and Tehran. An Iranian missile fired towards Israel and a series of Israeli airstrikes on Iranian sites in Syria. Here's Russia's foreign ministry spokesperson earlier today. The practice of arbitrary power strikes on the territory of a sovereign state, in this case we are talking about Syria, should be banned. In our opinion, forging an atmosphere of hostility in the region is not in the long-term national interests of any of the Middle Eastern governments, including, of course, Israel. We must not allow Syria, which has suffered over many years of armed conflict, to become an arena for settling geopolitical disputes. Let's go now to our defense correspondent, Daniel Semek, in our Tel Aviv studio. And, Danny, that's a little more direct talk from Russia that we have heard on Israeli strikes in Syria. Yes, Club, we've heard Russia taking maybe a harsher tone and a harsher stance uh, towards the Israeli actions. In the past, Russia hasn't necessarily been supportive explicitly, obviously, of Israeli strikes in Syria, but has acknowledged this, the importance of Israel uh, reserving the right to stand by its red lines and not allow Iran to encroach um, closer to, let's say, 85 kilometers to Israel's border, which was once promised between the two. But it's important to, to note that there has been a shift, and that shift has been compounded by the strikes that you were describing earlier. Massive strikes against Syrian and Iranian assets within Syria. A fatal strike that led to over 20 fatalities. And we have spoken to military officials, former intelligence chiefs, that have said explicitly that Russia and Iran do not appreciate to be made to look like fools. And it may indeed be that that is the reaction we are seeing here, that Israel's transparency and pride in these recent strikes, uh, not just the ones that occurred between Sunday and Monday, but in recent days, is indeed bringing about a different response from the Russian camp. All right, Daniel, thank you for now. But let's focus even more on Syria, because on Russia, because it does play a big role in this story. The Kremlin is a key Iranian ally, and the Israeli premier has met with Russian President Putin numerous times to try and get them to rein in Iran's presence in Syria. Our Tracy Alexander sat down with Russia's ambassador to Israel, Anatoly Viktorov. Here's what he told her about this week's escalation. What will Russia do and what can Russia do to prevent Iran's aggression towards Israel from Syria? What do you call the Iranian aggression? When we're seeing a missile launched from... How many people were killed by this aggression? Because Israel has an Iron Dome air defense system that managed to intercept that missile. So, so how I many people were killed by the uh, Israeli operation? As we know, we're it's not just talking suggestion. about death I'm sorry, it's just suggestions. Sure, sure. And we, we, of course, uh, they're serious uh, suggestions, serious accusations. And, of course, we are seriously, uh, we, we will continue seriously taking into account all this uh, uh, possible scenario and possible uh, uh, threats to the security of the state of Israel. And more, more uh, generally, we would prefer that sooner or later, better uh, sooner, uh, there will be uh, negotiations between Israel and Iran about all uh, existing problems. Because it's counterproductive to, uh, to see the situation in the, in the Middle East through one prism only. It's uh, Iran's threat. It's not uh, the, the main uh, reason for the tensions in the region. It's not the main uh, reason. We, 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 we can understand what Israeli colleagues are talking about and telling us, but the main threat is uh, uh, the existence of the international terrorism. It's uh, Daesh, it's uh, Drabkat and Nusra and uh, Al-Qaeda affiliated uh, groups and, for, and forces. Another significant change that we've been talking about here on the rundown is the apparent end of Israel's no-comment policy. This week, we saw both the military and the prime minister openly discussing airstrikes on Iranian targets in Syria. Here's what the Russian ambassador had to say on that. Uh, there is one change with, uh, which we noted that uh, in the past, uh, Israeli uh, minister of defense and or uh, commander of uh, Israeli armed forces, uh, they... Uh, very frequently made uh, immediate comments on any, any reports in the press, both local and international. But now, after the, each strike, each move, there is a statement uh, at a very, very high level. And uh, in our mind, it's uh, very much uh, connected with the uh, election campaign in, in, here in, the, in this country. 
Owen Alterman, Owen, diplomacy is all about sending uh, messages to various people. What kind of message do you think the Russian ambassador is sending there? And they read the message that they're in charge, that they're in charge, that Israel is small, that Israel's comments on this are determined and are driven by Israeli politics and that small, little, irritating democracy to the southwest of Syria, and that they can't really play with the big guns of Russia. It's Russia who's setting the terms of the game in Syria in the Middle East more broadly. You know, Nareet, I was thinking as I was watching those parts of Tracy's terrific interview, Look, it wasn't too long ago in Israel that some people here were hoping to try, and maybe Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu among them, to generate tensions between Russia and Iran and Syria, to try to play those tensions to Israel's advantage. Today's statements, whether it's from the ambassador or whether it's from the foreign ministry spokeswoman in Moscow, indicate that that's not working. At least as of today, at least as with those particular statements, I think that there will be many people in this country who have not given up hope on that strategy over the medium or long term, but at the moment it doesn't seem to be working. But Israel seems to have made a more or less permanent decision of right. being very, very forward about what it's doing once, in Syria. Once you put it out the there, it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Well, for anybody who thinks the war in Syria is over, this is a reminder that Fall it is not. Owen Alterman, thanks very much for that. Let's turn from there to the Israel-Gaza border. An exchange of threats is happening there, too. After Israeli soldiers came under fire from Hamas yesterday, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu announced he would block $15 million in Qatari aid that was supposed to enter Gaza today. This morning, Netanyahu followed that up with this. For those in Gaza who think they can challenge us, the response will be very harsh and very deadly and very painful. We are prepared for any escalation. We are prepared for any event. Well, let's go back to our defense correspondent, Daniel Tzermach, and Denny, some tough talk from the prime minister. Any reaction from Hamas and any reaction from this uh, cab Israeli security cabinet meeting that apparently just wrapped up? Well, Cliff, the first reports we're getting uh, that have leaked from that security cabinet meeting, nothing official uh, has come out, which is, generally speaking, the case. Generally speaking, certain reporters get access and they release information. What we do know now is that, obviously, Gaza was a subject of discussion, as was Syria. But on the Gazan front, there was uh, reports that Israel uh, has been—Israel, indeed, refused to allow the Qatari funding into the Gaza Strip. From that cabinet meeting, we understand that there was at least a camp of people within the meeting that said that that was not a good idea, that they should allow the Qatari funding back into the Palestinian enclave. This is a stance that's been supported even by the highest level of the Israeli military. Even in times with upticks in violence, they understand the Israeli military brass, that is, the importance of having at least stabilized economy there to not further exacerbate the situation. That is something that we actually heard earlier today, uh, according to an Israeli media outlet, uh, which cited a Hamas official saying that Israel uh, should be wary of refusing to allow the Qatari funding into the Gaza Strip because it could exacerbate tensions. Hamas official also said that they did not take responsibility for the previous day's shooting incident and that they will investigate that situation. All right, Daniel Tzemach in Tel Aviv. Thanks very much. For